It's not too often you can come into a church house and you can feel the unity uh, that the message of the cross brings to a people. Amen. It, it truly brings unity. And I thank God for that. Amen. Uh, if you guys have your Bibles, I'd go ahead and ask if you turn with me to the book of Acts. Amen. The book of Acts. And it's in chapter 16 where I believe we're going to take our text. Amen. The book of Acts chapter 16. And uh, I dealt, uh, <laughs> seems like, well, I should say the Lord dealt with me. Amen. I had a, uh, uh, I was thinking in regard and praying and uh, a somewhat state of desperation for a message from the Lord, amen, as, as I think, uh, I, I mean, as we often do as, as people who are supposed to prepare a sermon before uh, the children of God, you know, we find ourselves in a state of, uh, of, of burden, of, you know, sometimes of grief because you don't feel like the Lord's been speaking to you as you wish that uh, He would sometimes. And I, I know as believers, we've all been there, amen, we wish God <laughs> would speak to us a little bit more often, amen. amen. And uh, I, was, uh, I was in a state, like I said, of desperation for a message from God, and it was just a few weeks ago... Uh, uh, that the Lord had been dealing with me in this passage concerning this, uh, these couple of scriptures here in Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. And uh, I, I tell you what, I believe God has something special for us. Amen. Uh, and I don't, like I said, I don't just uh, say that. I, I mean that with my heart. I believe God truly has something special for us uh, this evening. Amen. And uh, I have to give a little bit of backstory before I truly dive into this text and tell you guys uh, what God had been dealing with me in specific in regarding to this message. I found myself, like I said, in a state of desperation. And uh, I can think of, of times where I would sit in class or I would sit uh, in my dorm room. I would find myself asking God, Lord, I need a message from you. I don't want to give these people just some Bible lesson that they'll go home and forget about. I want this to be a true word from the almighty throne room of God. I mean, I want this to be something that people can benefit from, that I can touch their hearts and touch their lives and uh, the Lord and, and the Spirit of God had begun to grip my heart and begin to deal with me in, the, in regards to this passage uh, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. And He was speaking to me in such a way that I had never felt it before. Because most of the time when God gives us, uh, whether it be like a, a, a certain word from, from heaven, we feel that God's kind of revealing to us or uh, He's dealing with us to uh, a certain uh, passage of Scripture, we find that God deals with us in, in specific. But I found this was kind of a general uh, general dealing, God was dealing with me, and uh, if that makes sense, it was in verse 16 of chapter 16. I'll go ahead and take the text, and uh, I'll read it, and then, and then I'll kind of dive into what I felt the Lord was dealing with me about. It's in verse 16 of Acts chapter 16. Give me a big hearty amen, amen. if you're there. Amen. amen. Praise God. You guys are ready. Amen. It says in verse 16, and it says, And it came to pass, now this is Luke writing in the book of Acts, and it says, As we went to prayer... A certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met with us, which brought her masters much gain by the soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And I'll the point just real quickly before we move on to verse 17. It should have been translated from the Greek text. It should have said, uh, which show unto us a way of salvation. We'll deal with that in just a moment. But it says in verse 18, and this did she many days, and Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. If you guys would bow your heads and pray with me and for me. God, we just thank you so much again for the opportunity to be in your presence, Lord. We don't treat it as something lightly, Father. We take it, and God, the heaviness that comes upon it, we thank you, God, for what you've done for us in our lives. I thank you for these believers, God, that are here in one mind and one accord. And God, I ask that your anointing would flow through us, God, that we can learn from your word today, God, that we can hear from the throne room of heaven. Father, I pray, God, that you would anoint me in such a way, God, without stutter or stammer, Lord, that, God, I could drive this word through your Holy Spirit to these people, Father. God, what word and message you have for us tonight, God, we open our hearts, God, as fertile ground and soil to receive. And it's in your precious Son's name, Jesus, that I pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. There was some time ago back in uh, Acts class, I was in Brother Larson's Acts class, and he does such a fantastic job, and I know he's been here and ministered before, and uh, I look up to this brother dearly, and uh, we were reading in this, this was second semester, I had been in Bible college in Baton Rouge, and originally from Missouri, from the Ozark, Southwest Missouri, and I moved down here, and uh, God, it's interesting, in the book of Acts had dealt with me in specific towards uh, what Pentecost truly was, it was teaching me uh, how to live in Pentecost, not just to have one experience and then say, that you were baptized with the Holy Spirit, but how to daily walk in the Spirit, amen? And I found that when we came across this specific chapter in the book of Acts, that there was something that pricked my heart, and I, I really couldn't tell you what it was. Sometimes God works in us, and well, honestly, most of the time, if not all the time, God works with us 
Uh, Brother Larson, he quotes it quite a bit here, a little, there a little, line upon line and precept upon precept. And I found myself in the book of Acts in chapter 16, and I wasn't quite understanding what I felt like I needed to understand in this short passage. Just two, two actually, excuse me, three verses. And when God began to, to deal with me in regard to this same passage about preaching tonight, I found myself uh, in, a, like I said, a state of desperation. That's probably my third time saying it, but I, I mean it. I mean it with the bottom of my heart. I was looking at every commentary I could get my hands on. I was searching on every free commentary online. I, and sometimes as a child of God church, we find ourselves wanting to find the answer. Amen. God was leading me into a direction. And what I found, I feel, is, is very profound according to the message of the cross and in regard to the message of the cross. And I found reading in studying and I would glean from one commentator, I would glean from another scholar, I would glean from uh, Brother Swaggart or I would glean from uh, Kenneth Weist and, and all of these guys and all these voices that were kind of aiding me in this study of these three verses. I found some very awesome truth, amen, in the, and like I said, in regard to the message of the cross. And I've got three points tonight and I believe that I won't be here before you long. I can't promise that, but I pray uh, that God would help me in such a way to not be here before you long, amen. And I know you guys are saying amen in your hearts. You're just too nice not to say it out loud. Amen. But as I began to study this, I, I read in Brother, uh, Brother Swaggart's Acts commentary, and I found something that was so interesting. And like I said while I was reading the text, in verse 17, I want to direct your attention. It says, The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us. And, and, and the text reads the way of salvation, but it's important for us to understand tonight in the original Greek text, it means a way of salvation. If you go back and you study that, and I'm not trying to be all technical or complex with you, but it really, it, it's referring to saying that this woman, if I could get you to draw your attention as a picture, maybe as an illustration, if we were uh, a part of what Luke might have seen, this woman who was making her masters much gain, what that means is she had much uh, soothsaying, she was a psychic in today's terms, and if you go to in New Orleans and even some places around here have psychics, fortune readers, and all of it has to deal with demonic spirits. Amen. And this girl was following Paul, and there could have been more than just Paul and Silas, but we know for sure Luke was there, and there could have been even more disciples. And this woman was behind them, and she was crying out, Here are servants of God. And obviously, this uh, the text reads that there was a demon, and, and this demon was crying aloud. I'm sure it must have been a horrific sight, but she was saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. And they are trying and they are proclaiming a way of salvation. In the Greek, the definite article, the, is not in the translation. So I'm going to say a way of salvation. And the reason that's important is because we have to know and understand that there's not many ways to, to, to salvation. It's one way, and that's Amen. Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah. Amen. And we find that in this specific instance, Paul was becoming very grieved at heart. And as any children of any child of God would be, he turned around and he cast the spirit out of her in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we find that I, I you know, I find in my heart and I find in my soul that there was something in this scripture. When I read it, I, it didn't make sense to me. I had no idea why I'm thinking, you know, and if I could picture this in my mind. For some reason, this woman is following these men of God who are unctioned and anointed from power on high with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. Why is a demon following them around through this girl and almost promoting them? Amen. And if you read it and you kind of think about it, it's like, why would, why would Satan or his, his wiles and, 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 this, and the demons that serve him, why would they follow after men of God and try to promote the gospel? Because it almost sounds like right here that Satan's trying to do God a favor, saying that these men are the servants of the Most High God promoting the way of salvation. And it makes me think and it makes me wonder why exactly would, would it be annoying for someone to promote the gospel? Obviously, we know it was demonic activity, so it wasn't meant to a, a spirit of, of helpfulness. It was something that was very uh, tragic. It was something that was very hindering, and it wasn't something that was a beautiful sight. And I've got this note here. It says, the demonic spirit knows that the presence and power of God is with these missionaries. Speaking of Paul and Silas and even Luke, and it says, the demon shouting is probably done in mockery. And it's intended to disrupt and not enhance the preaching of the gospel. Luke has already told us about a similar situation Jesus encountered where a demon keeps on shouting that Jesus is the Holy One of God. And that's found in Luke chapter 4 verse 34. And Jesus encountered some similar situations on several occasions. And I have the references here. But the first point I want to make tonight, and I want to reiterate just for a moment. The Holy Spirit along with the three triune Godhead... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit will not accept praise and worship from evil spirits. The Holy Spirit will only anoint the truth, which is Christ and Him crucified. I want to leave this right into the second point, moving later on. It says, the way of salvation 
should have been translated a way of salvation, as I mentioned before, because in the original Greek there is no definite article making the comment generalized. And this is where I want to, I want to deal with. In that day, this would have been referred to as a distraction simply because there has been, you know, in that day there was many polytheistic religions, just a fancy term for people believing in all the Greek gods, all the Roman gods, and whatever they believed in. But the problem with, with this demon crying aloud through this damsel, through this woman, is that it was proclaiming that there was more than one way to salvation. And I found, and as I studied that, it's nothing different in today's modern church. There are people and there are preachers, and it's unfortunate to say, and it grieves my heart, there are teachers of the gospel, or so-called the emergent church, that are saying that there's more than one way to salvation. And the reason I came across this passage, I believe, is because I want to convey to you today that anything, and we'll find in Galatians chapter 1, anything that comes against the message of the cross and in the truth, what's well, found in Scripture, is not from God, but it's from directly evil spirits, and it's directly from the flesh. Amen. Because right. I'll be frank and I'll be honest with you, when I began to hear, hear and, and let the message of the cross kind of sow into my heart, I, I was very rebellious. I was very rebellious to it because I didn't want to accept what it had for me. I didn't want to accept the fact that it was just a fight of faith because we're so performance-minded. Amen. That's right. That's right. I thought I could gain righteousness through a certain amount of prayer or a certain amount of fasting, but the truth of the matter is you're declared righteous. By faith, amen. Hallelujah. Paul deals with in Romans amen. 3, 4, and 5. And it's interesting to me that nothing has changed within several thousands of years. That demon spirits still to this day, even though they might be more disguised and might be more evil and cunning. They're going around to these churches. And, and I'll just turn there. In Galatians, Paul had to deal with these, the same spirit. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8. And I know you guys are familiar with it. You've heard this passage, I'm sure, many times before. He said, but though we or an angel from heaven, he, he included himself in this. And I think it's a bold statement for the Apostle Paul to say that even myself, if I come to you with a different message or an angel, he said, and they preach another gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, which is simply put the message of the cross, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. And Paul would very so plainly tell them that the message of the cross and what Christ has done for us and simple faith in that. And it's not in Paul really, and we call it in today's church, Galatianism. He had to deal with these Judaizers in the church that were saying that we had to keep the Old Testament sacraments. We had to keep the Passover to make us righteous. And God would look at us differently if we wore the prayer shawls. Or, and, that the, and the truth of the matter is, we are made righteous. And I have to reiterate once again, simply by faith alone, solely by faith. Amen? Amen. And the same spirit that's in the book of Acts in chapter 16 that was possessed this girl and this damsel. And now she obviously got free as the text states. And Paul, through the Holy Spirit and through the anointing and the power of God, cast the spirit out of her. But we find today is no different from that back then. That there are, are teachers, and like I said, it doesn't make me joyful to say this. I'm not looking down at somebody through my long nose and saying that you're wrong. And I say this as, as Paul prayerfully would have said it back to the church in Galatia. Preaching anything else except the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross at Calvary's cross. That the place of Golgotha for a way of salvation is a demonic spirit and let that man be accursed. Paul dealt with this so strongly, and I find it it's interesting to me that nothing within the last 2,000 years has changed. Technology might have changed, and the Bible even uh, prophesies to us that uh, there in, that, in those last days, knowledge will increase. But we find that in America, and I can say this because this is the country I'm from and live in, we have become puffed up and prideful for the knowledge that we've learned in these last couple centuries. Amen. And we find the nation of America is falling into this facade of, of do whatever you want, do whatever makes you happy. And it's nothing but demonic spirits. And I don't mean to be all mystical today. I'm not trying to be uh, somebody who's before you as saying everything's a demon spirit. But the truth of it is, the church of today, the modern church, and America included, has become so humanistic that we're bowing down to the knee of Baal. And I, and I heard the message this morning, Brother Donnie Swagger preached. Talking about how America has fallen because we are into this political correctness state of mind that everything has to be lined up with, the, I mean, everything should be lined up with the Constitution. I'm not trying to be necessarily political, but he was talking about the reason that we've bowed the knee to Baal is because we're too afraid to preach the truth. Amen. Right. Help us, Lord. And I've got to say, and if I could reiterate it enough, and I don't mean to be beating a dead horse by any means, but the truth 
of the gospel will set the hearts of men free. Amen. 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 The truth of the gospel, no matter what it sounds like to the ear, no matter what it might seem like. I've seen preachers get up on stages and it seems like they're mad and they're angry and right, rightfully so with the state of the church, but they're doing it out of love. God looks at this nation and he's, I'm sure, disappointed as we are. Because of the, th the things that, this, that we've turned to, that I've found myself turning to. I'm not saying that I'm the only one that has this message, not by any means. I consider myself to be less of any, but we have got to stay true to the simple fact that has saved us in Colossians 2.6. It's so powerful. One of the best scriptures of all of the Bible describing what true sanctification is. The same way that you've received Christ Jesus, also therefore walking in Him. How did we receive Christ Jesus? By faith, amen? So how do we walk in Christ Jesus? How do we overcome this sin that so easily besets us? By simple faith in the cross of Christ. And I know some of you guys, amen, praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand. Clap. Amen. And I know if, if you guys are like me, which I'm sure you are, i found myself many times when I hear the message of the cross preached and, and taught, I think if they continue to say that it's by faith, why am I struggling within myself? Yeah. And Paul, and I know Pastor Matt has, has done a, a fantastic job, I don't even, it goes without saying how he's taught Romans 6, 7, and 8, but I found myself, as many of you I'm sure, in the chapter uh, seven of Romans consenting to the law that it was good for me and then I find myself struggling that which I do I ought not to do I don't want to do it but I do it because I put my faith in my performance or I put my faith in trying to keep the law for a means of righteousness and I don't want to come to you and, and try to make things sound so complex but I, I want to give you guys the simplicity of the gospel and it's Jesus Christ and crucified we know that we understand that but it's by simple faith and like I said before some of you might look at me and I was there many times and sometimes still am in a sermon when I hear the message of the cross preached like this I, I get to kind of defensive I think to myself well preacher teacher I follow God by faith but I'm still struggling within my heart I'm still struggling in my life I'm falling under the dominion of sin the powers of darkness I find myself angry in Baton Rouge traffic. Amen. Anybody been there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I heard a joke one time. They said in the movie Back to the Future, you know, Doc Brown, where, where can you go that you don't need turn signals? And then on the caption it said, we're going to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> and you ask, you know, as I've been there millions of times before, why do I continue to struggle in this sin? Why am I falling into anger? Why am I falling into certain sins that it seems like it's not even a struggle I just fall into it I'm not here to say that it's not because you're submitting to the cross of Christ it's not because you're putting faith in it because to be saved your faith's in the cross amen it's not hard to be saved you know I, it's, it's, it's sad to me it's sickening to me that we've become and I'm saying this as we because as Pentecostals as, 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 as holiness churches and churches I've been a part of my whole life have gotten it wrong that it's hard to stay and be saved I do believe yes that you can become unsaved I don't believe in an unconditional eternal security but I believe that it doesn't have to be an an an, an experience where it's like after I sin then I'm not saved. No, your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified has saved you and it sets you free from sin's grip and it's making your sin nature dormant, amen. And sometimes yes, though we act in sin or sometimes uh, certain sins come about in us it's not because the sin nature is revived in you, it's because we're fallen human beings, amen. And I want to exhort you and encourage you today that when you fall and you fail and you find yourself at the end of a tunnel where it seems like there's no light Jesus Christ still forgives, amen. amen. I'm coming to you to tell you that amen. Jesus Christ still forgives your sins. Don't feel that you're so beyond repair that God can't help you. God can forgive you. And I find myself, this gives me hope. God gave me this one day that, God, if you can't forgive, there's no reason for me to live. Amen? It lets me know that there is nothing in this life for me to live for if God can't forgive. So I'm here to tell you, the only hope that we have is that Christ can still forgive us. Amen. Amen. And that helps us in our walk. Amen? And I've been there and you know, Brother Larson, I've learned this from him and it's so amazing. It's such a revelation that Every attack of Satan, and this refers back to this specific chapter in Acts 16, and I'm uh, running long on time, but I'll be just a few more minutes. Every attack of sin in a believer's life, and I know you've heard this quoted before, is an attack of your faith. 
And I'm just going to be frank with you, be honest with you. I've been there and I've sat there and I thought in the midst of temptation, well, I, God, you know, Satan, he can't affect my faith. I've been a Christian since I was seven years old. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 14. I say there's no way he can affect my faith. I'll never, ever, ever, I'll never. I take heed lest you stand when you fall. Come on, brother. Amen. I'll never, I've said to myself, struggle in my faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Amen. But what happens after you sin? What happens when temptation takes its toll and you fall into that very sin that so easily besets you? And it's, it's different for everybody. Could be for, for some sexual immorality. Could be for some jealousy, envy. A lot, and most of us, it's pride. What sin will do for a born-again believer in the walk of sanctification in someone's life and heart will make you think and it will deceive you in saying that Christ cannot forgive you. We've all been there before. After we sin, we fall. We find ourselves like, God, can you really can you really take this from me? Can you truly forgive me? Am I, I'm not good enough to withstand the presence of God. And truthfully, we're not. But you know what makes us worthy in the sight of God? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. When Christ died and He spilled His blood for you and me, He can forgive all sin, past, present, and future. God is that good. It's the only news that's too good to be true. Amen. Amen. Christ can still forgive and He can still heal a broken heart. Amen. Amen. You can't find yourself to forgive a, an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend. You can't find yourself to forgive a family member that's done you wrong or a business member that's cheated you. I'm telling you, God can let you forgive them. God can give you a certain amount of strength to say that I forgive them. Amen. God Amen. can still forgive. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. You know, my, my third and final point is, is, is simple. And, and it, it, it makes me it makes me so joyful to be able to share, share this because I, church, I, I, if I, if you guys haven't got anything out of this, I, I'm telling you, I'm getting something out. I Amen. feel God. Amen. I thank God for, for the preaching of the word. Amen. 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 And, 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 and this is my third and final point, and, and I won't be here much longer. I'll get out of your guys' hair. It says, I've written down this in, in, my, third, in, my, third, in my third point, and I, and I think it's, it's important to reiterate. The same thing, and I, I said this, I don't know how many times already, the same thing is happening today. Many are claiming the gospel is merely a way, just like this demonic spirit in the damsel. They're claiming that there is a way and not the way. Faith and, faith and grace is the only means man and women, of course, can be saved. Faith in the cross of Christ. And I want to turn back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, and read it once again. Because it's such a strong statement. It's so powerful. Paul had mentioned this. He said, but though we, and he's again speaking of himself. So that means if Brother Matt and his grace and mercy has me back just to visit with you guys, that means if I come back and I'm preaching anything other than what I've preached tonight, it says we an, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached, let him be accursed. And Paul merely was just stating that anybody who preaches anything other than the simple sacrifice of Christ and Him crucified, and Him risen again on the third day, sitting on the right hand of the Father. The Bible tells us He's interceding on our behalf. What is He interceding on? And I want to give this example just real quick. When Peter was at the 40 days of Jesus, when He spent, He taught the disciples after He rose again from the, from the grave. He said, Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. That's right. God's still doing that on our behalf today. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's seated. You know what means? You know what it means in the specific term in the Greek that he's seated? It means that he has all power and authority from on high. He has every power from heaven and every power on earth. Amen. Amen. And he's interceding on our behalf. Amen. He's interceding that our faith fail not. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, that, that encourages me tonight, church. Amen. Thank God that we have, I mean, a risen Savior. Amen. We're the only ones privileged, and I mean this as a Christian body, as a, a, a body of Christ. Whoever's accepted the sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ, we're the only religion, I'll, I'll use it for this statement, we're the only religion that allows ourselves to believe in a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. One who, who we can go to for everything. You got a math test in school. I was terrible at math. I took math all the way up to my sophomore year. My highest grade of math was algebra two. And I said, I'm done. I'm going to be a preacher. I'm not going to be a mathematician. 
He can help you with a math test. Amen. Amen. The most simple things. It tells us in Philippians, if I'm not mistaken, that cast your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Amen. Be careful for nothing but in everything. Continue to pray and uh, cast your care on Him. Amen. Well, church, I, I, I thank you guys so much. I, it's been an honor. It's been a true privilege. And, and I was, like I said, I struggled. And I, this must be my fifth, sixth time saying that I was in a state of desperation. And in Acts chapter 16, these two, three verses that we dealt with, I, I had no idea where I was going to get uh, with that. But the Holy Spirit was pricking my heart and I couldn't escape it. Amen. And um, I feel like it, it turned out to be what God had wanted for this house. Amen. Amen. You guys enjoy it. Amen. Yeah. Enjoy it. Amen. Yeah. Yeah.